he went through um talk to me in korean grammar level book uh, from one to ten he 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 was diligent he was consistent he went through uh, many vocab books uh many vocab tools that he can use on his phone or computer um but he was telling me he just couldn't uh, none of those stick to him mm. and he didn't he doesn't feel like he's absorbing korean as a language hello hailey hey alvaro <laughs> well uh, welcome welcome to the podcast first of all it's really a pleasure to have you here thank you so much for having me it, it's a great honor <laughs> And well, as as usual, yes. Um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background, your experience with languages, your successes, your failures, and and yeah, yeah. think is relevant. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm from South Korea, and you know, I think I can find I will find a lot of people that can relate to me uh, who come from societies or countries that have like a high pressure on learning the second language um mm. in korean's cases it was uh mm. english and um you know i i think that as a privilege i uh and that um i know i realized that just recently that it was a privilege my perspective has changed a little bit but um so growing up i was just naturally given that opportunity to learn english um as a korean because um so English was always was always there throughout uh, 12 years of um, my school life from elementary to until I graduated high school. And but the thing is, I learned um, English as uh, a test material, a, a, an exam. Mm -hmm. my, my, for, for 12 years, my only goal of life <laughs> kind of being dramatic dramatic but <laughs> I learned English just to pass that exam I my goal was to get a hundred uh out of hundred in that English exam out of 12 years so I always uh look back looking back think like um I wish I had more fun it, it's just it was you know it's a stressful process mm -hmm. if you I actually ended up getting 98 out of 97 out of 100 mm -hmm. um in that like you know like Korean SAT type exam to go to to enter the college and um if you if I would have gotten 80 not a 98 instead of 97 I would have gotten a scholarship to the at the university that I wanted to enter that one point made me um uh lose that huge opportunity of you know financially saving money helping my parents whatever um so you know I and I, I want to just mention briefly about uh thinking that chance as a privilege because um uh here I, I came to America I met my husband who is American um and he is really passionate about learning Korean um and he's giving me all this new perspective and um, all the different ways of learning language, uh, making me realize all that. And one of the one of it was, um, I thought my husband was privileged. He he has the advantage because he's a native uh, English speaker, mm -hmm. and I was kind of forced to learn English um, to just become a normal uh, person who can contribute to the, to the society and like you didn't have to do any of that and you know how, how how much work that was for me to even just that was just a lot of work and but for my husband he was never given that opportunity that they, he, he learned Spanish he, there were my, my, some language courses throughout the school years but it wasn't anything like how Korea does with English, um, and just socially, I I had that long period of time. Um, regardless of how effective it was, I was exposed to the language, okay. and I think that just got piled up and brought me up to this level. 
and um, maybe there are some parts that were way more effective than the than five years. I don't know, but um, like now, you know, as a self learner, like my husband who doesn't have, he has to find his own teacher. My parents brought me teachers, English teachers. I was just sitting here and I was given textbooks. I was given good uh, quizzes, exams, but he has to find all of that by himself. Um, and yeah, now I'm like, I, I am very lucky to be born in a country that um, require, requires English um, to be uh, kind of big part of my life. Even after people graduate uh, high school, I wanted to continue. I wanted English to be uh, continuously be my life. So I, I went to um, uh, university foreign for la for foreign languages in Busan, and um, that's where I I put myself into the the environment that I can continue speaking. Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of friends who choose not to. They ended up st studying geology geography um math and english just became just something like in the uh, left in the dark corner they don't they right. don't use english at all but um we continue to be exposed uh to english um by just living in korea just such as you know i forgot the exact number but a huge decent percentage of uh signs on of the stores or markets, the the advertisement, um, they use English. Everything's written in English. Uh, people can read English. Maybe they don't have chances to speak English, but they they read. They think in English. We we have a word, uh, Konglish, Korean plus English. So okay. we kind of, um, uh, modify the the pronunciation, whatever, and then use it as a Korean right. word. But it came from in yeah in English uh western countries so it's um we continue to be exposed to that um <clears throat> excuse me so let me to go back to my uh background mm -hmm. uh another thing that my husband made me realize is that so because that 12 years of school life was so stressful mm -hmm. i only i kind of is, uh, started to perceive my in, uh, language learning journey as something that was just so stressful. I I had never had fun. Mm. This was forced on me. But um, after like, I don't know, six months of um, uh, thinking about language with my husband, I realized, actually, I did this. Actually, I also mm. did that. Actually, mm. And uh, I want to tell you what those were. Um, so uh, with my husband to teach him Korean, we are reading like children's book in English. And we, we look at the pictures together. We describe the pictures um, in, in only in Korean. And like, and we just read the, the books, the easy books with easy drawings, uh, intuitive. And I, I I did that before I maybe um when I was in elementary school, six years of elementary school, um, I went to an English academy and my English teacher uh, uh brought these many uh, storybooks such as Cinderella, Snow White. Right. I remember this, yeah, all those classic stories that that um, just come to you. I I read those stories in Korean as well, like way long time ago. But now I'm reading this in English. I remember, you know, the those huge series has their, its own style. I know where the, I um I remember all of that. And there was this one book, something about rabbit. And I was having this was um I was young, way younger, maybe 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was having so so much fun reading this story about a rabbit and maybe it was like 15 pages of a uh, very thin storybook mm -hmm. and I I remember reading it over and over I uh, listened to the with the cassette um, player I, I listened to it over and over and I remembered it and I when I came back to our next um, English session with my tutor um, 
and she played the cassette and I I uh, could just remember what's going to happen in the story and I as the cassette was playing I uh, played through I spoke and she was she's like oh my gosh Haley what are you what did you do and I just remember having so much fun with that mm. book and that's something I forgot I had I had fun I had time mm. that I had fun um and when in so after I decided to go to which I'm grateful I uh, because I decided to go to that uh, university of foreign languages I was able to continue speak English um actually my major was uh English translation in, and interpretation so I wanted to be an interpreter and um there were uh professors who are native speakers um um and th they they taught uh biology <laughs> so randomly and they also taught uh world history okay. um pretty related that... topics right <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah biology was a lot of uh <laughs> um required a lot of memorizing but mm. still you know you you listen to the professor in english um and i also met so many people um from different parts of korea they there were also fellow um uh, international students from china or japan who came to our university to maybe study korean i don't i remember their majors but um i'm grateful that i continue to be that environment where language is uh, different language mm. makes a culture um right yeah and my senior one of uh my senior offered me this one winter during this winter break he offered me to come to the um ski school uh, it it was at a ski resort but they had um foreign ski school so he he knew i could speak english <laughs> i was more comfortable at speaking uh english and having conversation than maybe other students that he knew of so mm -hmm. he offered me that opportunity and um I took it I'm so happy that I took it so I I, I went to the ski resort worked there for two um a little over two months um at the like a reception area mm -hmm. um greeting people who who are foreigners who are visitors and I'm um, I introduced them what the ski school is. Uh, I introduced them the courses. I understood the le their levels of ski and snowboarding. Um, and that's another. That's I I almost forgot. I I remember having fun, and that was like um you know as a fresh graduate of high school, I, it's um one of the new part time jobs. So it was a job, but I think uh being there and working there for two months. Uh, meeting people from different backgrounds everywhere every day was huge it just right. um boosted up my comfort level mm -hmm. yeah and uh um my other uh experience was I liked speaking English not just reading um so I participated in this speaking contest in in English yeah, I, I wrote a story about <laughs> making a million dollars. I don't remember the the main point of the story, but I remember <laughs> I used that money as the theme. Um, right. and I, I, yeah, I, I went to the contest. I didn't get any, um, I didn't get anything out of it. But I, that was also another experience that I, I, I gave myself to. So you were already thinking in dollars, not one, right? <laughs> let me let me no, think back. <laughs> Maybe one. Um, <laughs> no, just it's kidding. Very, just yeah, kidding. it's very possible. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's wonderful. And Thank well, you. I have a couple of questions, but also mm -hmm. several ideas that I was thinking about while you were talking. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, first of all, this that. We're so lucky today that we have the internet that mm -hmm. you know, 
you don't quote unquote you don't really need to go through those types of experiences necessarily in order to be exposed to the language because you can just go to youtube and find content or right. it depends on where you live but if you're in a relatively big city you can find mm -hmm. a lot of foreigners um, events you can go to that's what i do okay. here in krakow for example like okay i use polish here in poland but you know, there's it's such an international city that I can go to different events, you know, talking in different languages, plus YouTube at home and other platforms. So it's mm -hmm. it's just so different. Mm -hmm. Then um, I was thinking that well, first of all, it's just such an a stressful experience for a teenager. I can imagine, <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking if. You know that you were talking about getting exposed to the language and to foreigners in your ski job and things like that. Mm -hmm. I always think about that because uh, when I was a kid, my parents had friends in in France, mm -hmm. right? They still do, but we used to go every summer to France, and oh, that's I, awesome. didn't, I didn't necessarily learn a lot. You know, besides those, you know bonjour and things like that in in that period because mm -hmm. my friend my parents had friends but they didn't have kids of my age so it's not that i um, spent in time with kids it was there right. with family and so on so i learned a few words but but just the fact of being exposed to the language i think obviously there's no way for me to prove that right <laughs> but mm -hmm. it may have uh, it may have had an impact on my love for languages later on absolutely yes yeah. Even if I didn't actually learn the language, right? Then I was also thinking about your experience then that when you graduated from high school that you talked about some of your friends just going into a different type of college, studying mm -hmm. um, biology, all things. I, I was wondering if you did go on and continue to study English because you were so passionate about it, but that pressure may have prevented your friends from pursuing that career but you you were just so passionate about it that you could have gone that way uh anyway you know what i mean yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. yeah i was thinking about it actually i so um i think i already had that passion even before i started mm. the schools i yeah there's something that came naturally. I uh, my parents right. told me that I, they uh, I was very young, maybe three or four years, just barely walking. Um, they brought me the, to this uh, bigger city, uh, a bigger park, and there were a lot of tourists walking around. And um, I grabbed my my dad's pants and I told him, looking up, I want to speak to that person. And I pointed that person. He that person had different skin color, different eye color. He looked uh, like a foreigner. I'm like, I want to talk to that person. I don't remember this, but my parents kept bringing it up because they're proud of me. Um, and that I, I think they think this, it that that I was supposed to be here. You know, now I became, uh, yeah. the the person who I am. And they kept bringing that memory up. And yeah. so, so yes, I think the difference between my friends and me was that. Even after twelve years of a uh, stressful period, I maybe subconsciously, uh, even I I didn't like the, um, I didn't like the fact that I have to read uh, paragraphs, uh, within a minute, have to answer five questions and move on to another paragraph. It, it was all competition, mm. and it it was uh, um, time was ticking and. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't for fun. Yeah. Um, it was only for reading and getting the good grades. I didn't like that part, but maybe subconsciously I still loved English. Mm -hmm. I still mm -hmm. loved the other language. Yeah. Um and I uh, if I didn't go to that uh university of foreign languages, I would have gone to uh, uh study um trade. I don't remember the exact a major name but I would have been I would have gone there it, but which also might require uh English speaking or a different mm -hmm. language right. um to to yeah to work in that industry 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that might have been the difference. Other people, they Sorry. they were just forced. They didn't have that love, that interest and affection to Sorry. another language. Yeah, the, the scary part sometimes is some of those may have, not, a, not as, as high as yours, but may have a little bit of passion when it comes to languages, but that stressful process, they might they may have connected, you know, the two things, like stress and learning in foreign languages. So English that actually equals... Pre- yeah, oh. actually pre- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you were so passionate that, you know, it didn't make a difference in your life because you would have gone there anyway, right? That, mm-hmm. that, but the bottom line that I wanted to get to is that after th- those 12 years, you started talking about what you were doing in your free time, right? The thing mm-hmm. is that conscious or traditional instruction is easier to give the credit to, right? Because it's more measurable. But as I, as you were talking about it, I was thinking, but you know, when you started talking about the books you were reading and so on, so probably those are the things that were actually helping you out the most, mm-hmm. but because they're more, I don't know, abstract, if you will. Like it, it's hard to say, you know, I've, I've read three books, so I've, I've gotten this much better, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas the more conscious part, you can measure it in grammar rules or exercises you're going through, you know, right. but it's actually the other part that's helping you, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I want to appreciate my English teachers uh, in the past for that. Like they, they brought interesting books, cute books, awesome. uh, aesthetically pleasing books, and they complimented my progress. Um, they brought, they knew my level exactly, and they brought the right books, and they gave me the raw, right materials, and um, and mm-hmm. thank, thanks to them, I was able to have fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they spark their interest, right? That's that's uh, that that's the main job for a teacher in my eyes, you know, like sparking their interest or you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so yeah, that so that leads me to I, I want to ask you about how your English was after those 12 years. Like when you graduated graduated from high school, mm-hmm. could you communicate in English actually? Or how, how was it? I think I was. I don't remember when was the first time okay. uh, that I spoke English to someone who doesn't speak Korean. Um, or... Um, Actually, yeah, I don't remember. I, I went to the university. Maybe I was shy, but maybe I was able to articulate myself mm-hmm. um, and then have the conversation uh, timidly with my English professors. I, I remember asking them, can I call you? Uh, should I call you Professor Dixon or uh, Dixon? And he told me, just call me Dixon. Um, that kind of little conversations, maybe I started with those. Okay. Um, I wasn't as afraid of uh, mm-hmm. speaking English compared to my uh, friends. Right. Yeah. Probably because of those other activities you were doing in your free time, right? Because uh, th- the reason I'm asking is because my experience, and I think the experience of many others, is I went through the whole process, like you said, with English in elementary school, high school, and so on, for mm-hmm. f- pretty much 15 years, I'd say. And I pass like all the time, not with those, not with those crazy expectations expectations Mm -hmm. that you were talking about, but you know, I did good enough to pass all the grammar exams, all the courses, and so on. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that process, I just couldn't speak the language. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's that's the experience so many of us had and kids still have nowadays, right? So that's the reason why because. Um, having all those years of English doesn't mean that you're actually going to acquire the language, which is, I I understand, is the our ultimate goal, right? Like, we want to be mm-hmm. able to communicate. Like, passing that exam is nice, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but, you know, the, the main reason why we want to learn a foreign language is to be able to communicate, right? To be able yes. to yeah. have different experiences, talk to different people, like you said, when, when you were three, four years old, you know, <laughs> with... Mm-hmm. Um, and is there any other language that you're learning or that you have experience with? 
I am interested in Japanese, but I haven't uh, properly started yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Korean is, I'm basically relearning Korean. You, you know how it feels like when somebody asks you why things work like this in uh, Spanish? Sometimes you can't answer. It's just how it is. Yeah. And uh, I, I did it so many times with my husband and it's not helping. Um, so yeah, maybe <laughs> I want to say right. Korean because I'm having a lot of uh, good time doing Korean related stuff with my husband. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it's a subconscious process. It's really hard to, hard to say when clicked, when, because it's not a process that happens overnight. Right. So it's right. not that you wake up one day and, oh, I'm fluent in German. Right. <laughs> this right. is process. And I have a couple of questions about Korean and different alphabets that I always ask my students. I mean, my inter my guests from you know China, Korea, Japan, Japan, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, I want to ask you about comprehensible input specifically. Like, when did you get into it? How did you get into it? Or... Um. So, yeah, it's it basically started with my husband okay. and um. Now that I'm thinking about it, I, I had comprehensible input as growing up, having fun with those, mm. but I didn't put that label to that experience. Right. So it, it's it's been only recent that I realized what comprehensible is. Um. So met my husband who didn't speak Korean, but he wanted to learn so bad. He went through, um, talked to me in Korean grammar level book uh, from one to 10. He, he, he was diligent, he was consistent. He went through uh, many vocab books, uh, many vocab tools that he can use on his phone or computer. Um, but he was telling me he just couldn't, uh, none of those stick to him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he doesn't feel like he's absorbing Korean as a language. He, he, it, it is true that um, having that foundation of grammar and vocab is may be necessary uh because so that you can understand other people why people make a sentence like that way that's how you understand through grammars and vocabs um but uh and i i've heard a lot of panels in your uh diff previous videos uh mentioning about this that mm -hmm. gr uh, grammar and grammar and vocab vocab it's not it, it's not gonna last long it's only the rules and the the biggest challenge is how do you apply the rules? How do you uh, use the vocab that you learned yesterday in the textbook today in the conversation with me? And that was the hardest part with my husband. Mm -hmm. And um, so he looked all over the internet and he finally came across uh, from principal input and TPRS. Mm -hmm. uh, he was watching videos of uh, Steve Kaufman and Stephen Kreshen's videos yeah. and their theologies. Um, um, so many podcasts and interviews and different ways of learning uh, like a different language. And yeah, he kind of brought that into my life as well. Um, so he started with Magic Treehouse uh, and we went, we visited Korea. Um, and you, do you know Magic Treehouse? It's uh, I think all the Americans know they every every American read that book growing up. It's like a popular series of, for children's. Okay. And we were able to get that series from at least 10 books, uh, Magic Treehouse in Korean when we visited Korea. So he his suitcase was filled with these Korean books. Um so we had we now he 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 read the story a long time ago and he loved the story. Now he's rereading it in Korean. And I think that's basically the beginning of his comprehensible input journey mm -hmm. he reading helped him so much and reading something that he's interested in ha could have fun with helped him so much um he ran through those books so quickly he told me what happened in the book he would never stop telling me what happened and he <laughs> um even though the books might be using some words that we may never use in right, real right. life because it's a fantasy book. Um, but he he I think he enjoyed all those little moments that he looked looks 
looks up the vocab words and then put it in there. Oh, this is a grammar I learned from Tutamik. And that's, yeah, that's how it started. And then we came across this short stories in Korean by Ollie Richards. Um, mm. This book was a tremendous help for my husband. And this is where I could really see, oh, this is the impact of comprehensible input. Um, this is what it could do to language learners. He, uh, this book, thankfully, was just above his level um, of his Korean. Mm. And he was able to just enjoy the stories, not having to spend so much time on looking up words or grammars. He, he, yeah, he read it over and over. And he, I think he read it at least five times through all through the books. And he was just having fun. This is, yeah, it's awesome. It, yeah. I And I could see how happy he was. He was so proud of himself. I'm finally making a progress. He can actually see the progress, like you said, something that, that's tangible. This mm. one book, I read it five times and it's only written written in Korean and I can talk about the story with my wife. And that that's so rewarding and that's something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And that I that's where I un really understood um, the impact of comprehensible input. And um, we all, he... My husband also got into uh, uh, comic books for young adults and young children, um, but in, in, in Korean, we went to, we scoured all over the Korean bookstores. We had so much fun. He found a series of books, uh, comic books that it's fun. It's about daily lives, slice of life. And he he's also reading it. And I, th this is comprehensible input because he can understand what is happening without having to know exact word in each bubble. He he can he knows what they what their emo what this character's emotions are, what they're what they're feeling about right now and where they're gonna go to do to do the next activities. And yeah, that I, I would say that's how I yeah, there's more context into it as well. You have the pictures, you know the characters. If there's like a series of books, you know the characters, you know their their personality. Exactly. So that's gonna help you understand the message. Yes, not you know their personalities, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we're you're yeah, those visuals on the book uh is a great help. Exactly. And I do the this TPRS session with my uh started doing this. We have, for example, this. Book. Um, we got found this book. Sorry, it's kind of the lighting. The uh, okay. Yeah, I went to the second hand bookstore and found this book, and we were just going through pictures together, um, mm -hmm. and describe the pictures. It we were not reading the stories. We were talking about mm -hmm. why they're doing what they're doing, and what do you think they're going to do next and yeah that come that comes with the the uh the understanding that we both have based on this picture in front of us so it's not you're not trying to make a story make up a story from a, a complete blank page mm -hmm. it, and we're looking at the same thing i know what you're talking about even though i don't understand the exact word that you just spoke i know i assume this is what you meant yeah, and yeah. I say that again. That's meaning, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. And I say that again. And then he finally asked, Do you, is that word, does that word mean this? And I'm like, yes, exactly. And that's how, how things stick to him. Mm -hmm. This is truly amazing. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, plus getting back to his early days with those grammar books and so on, not only was he not getting results, but I'm guessing he wasn't having a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> As opposed to well, how much fun he's he's having right now with you know all the um, activities that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. He it was rewarding in terms of, okay, I finished book two. Now moving on to book three, um, and there are, uh, it's good that he has a goal of, uh, I'm gonna finish book number chapter four, uh, this week, but, um. It always bothered him so much. How am I going to use this? How are these grammar rules yeah. going to help me? And that 
couldn't help yeah. him more to enjoy it, enjoy the process more. Yeah. And it's just, and it's such a different language. It's not that he was learning German, right? Or a related language, right? Just so that, that makes it even more complicated. I was talking mm -hmm. about that. It was Polish that sort of opened my eyes when it comes to mm -hmm. that. Because for me, as a native Spanish speaker, if I try to learn Portuguese, Italian, even French, I can fool myself for a while. That's the way I like mm -hmm. to put it, right? But when I first tried to learn Polish, mm, that was an eye-opening experience. Totally different. It didn't mm -hmm. make any sense, right? Um, so was then that moment that you decided to start your channel and create videos, comprehensible input Korean videos? Yeah, it, um, he, it's, he, he, yeah, he looked up, uh, what, uh, available materials are on YouTube. There weren't that many, mm -hmm. um, some of them were helpful, um, but there were not some some of them he he had better ideas he wish he has the certain ideas that oh i wish i had this i wish this was easier mm. i wish they um spoke this way i wish they used this materials having fun and he had this so many fun ideas so and he brought those to me and all right why not we're already doing it so it's awesome yeah yeah, actually, like I leave all the links to your channel and on the title and everything, but I encourage people to check it out. I checked out the, the, your first video and it was through a video game, right? But a mm -hmm. simple one. So, and it's, yeah, like you said, it just, it's so much fun to, to learn. Like, I mean, it's so much fun and it's effective, right? So it's like a win win as opposed mm -hmm. to not effective and not fun. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And so getting now to the alphabet, I'll I'll go to, to my questions in a moment. But when mm -hmm. you say that your husband was reading books in Korean with Korean characters or? or oh, it, yeah. He's. OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Right now he's reading. He, he's reading Korean books made for Korean audience. So it's not that there's like in Chinese and Mandarin, there's a pinging that makes it sort of easier to read for Westerners, I'd say. Oh, like Romanized English, you mean? Uh, Romanized yeah. Korean. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Romanized Korean. Um, No, these books that he's reading now do not have Romanized uh, Korean. The so Korean. he, okay. uh -huh. he, yeah, he, he learned, he picked up the language so quickly and um, through reading, he his reading uh, speed of reading also has increased, speed it up, mm -hmm. sped up a lot. Um, and now you know we're watching a YouTube uh, video, um, with Korean subtitles or a Korean movie with Korean subtitles, and he sometimes they they talk really fast, but many most of the times he can actually read at the same time as as he's watching the movies. So yeah. it, it has improved a lot. And that I think that came from reading, not relying on um, Romanized Korean, yeah. just being comfortable with the actual alphabets, uh, Korean mm -hmm. Hangul, and then, yeah, kept reading it over and over. Yeah, I like that. I, I'll get into the questions in a moment, but because I'm really passionate about this topic, because in the future, when I try to learn, you know, Korean, Japanese, Mandarin, um, because my only experience with the language with a different alphabet is Russian. Mm -hmm. I'm in the process of learning the language now. And I can already read. And I remember the way I learned how to read in Russian. It's, it's still relatively close if you compare that to Japanese or Korean, close to, my, to our languages, I mean, in, mm -hmm. in Europe and so on. But it, it, I've talked about it many times, but I, I'll tell you is that through comprehensible input videos on YouTube, mm -hmm. there's a woman called Ina, and she's especially good at, at this. Her time is named Comprehensible Russian. And uh, well, she has cultural videos about Russia, mm, food, uh, mm -hmm. history, you know, in a comprehensible way with um, drawings and a lot of things. And in some of her videos, she had a map of Europe with the country names in Cyrillic. Mm. 
And I started to realize she talked about France and Finland. So it was, and, and I realized the first letter of the, both those two countries mm-hmm. was, it's called like, a, I call it like a, a circle with a stick. Okay. <laughs> There's probably a name for it. So <laughs> I started to, ah, so that's our F sound, right? Mm-hmm. Little by little, that's the way I sort of acquire the Cyrillic alphabet. That, that's that's why I can read in Russian. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean that I understand uh, um, a complicated book, but I can read it. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I've I've been having this discussion with a lot of people recently about learning different alphabets. And first of all, I wanted to ask you about your husband's journey. How did how did he get started with? learning the characters because i'm assuming even if it's a super simple book if you don't know anything about the characters it's just it's not comprehensible right right um so did he memorize some characters did he did he try to i I don't know if it's like japanese or mandarin that some of the characters you can figure out because they're the combination of two other characters or things like that Mm-hmm. Yeah, consonants and vowels. Yeah, he he. I remember um, the very first thing he did was learning Hangul alphabet, uh, the consonants and vowels. Um, he yeah he learned those alphabets first, before so that he could read. Um, did I answer your question? Maybe could you ask one more time to give? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, no worries. Uh, so my yeah my question is how did he first get in contact with the alphabet so did he learn the characters separately and then apply that into being able to read oh yes he there are many um i don't know the exact tool he used but he had okay. like for example like a mobile web but uh, not web mobile app um mm-hmm. for teaching Hangul alphabet. He he uh, definitely did that first before he started he before he opened any Korean books. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. Yeah. So okay. and um like some some of the beginner level, like level one and level two of Titimik, they they do have Romanized uh, English. I don't know how uh how much he referred to those, but okay. um if he had to, there those were available on the the beginner level books too. But I I know he learned Hangul first uh, as a separate okay. category and then moved yeah. on. Right, because to, to give you even more context, um, I I always listen to people talk about the fact that so you have to memorize the characters, learn the alphabet. Whether we're talking Japanese, Mandarin, Korean. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you know you you have to learn some characters and then all the characters you can figure them out because they're the combination of other characters things like that but for example with Japanese I believe they have three different alphabets and one of them has around 10,000 different characters I don't know if it's kanji mm-hmm. or which one uh, I think it was kanji yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm always like I'm, I'm whatever the topic I always try to think what sounds like the most natural thing, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I I always think about having to memorize ten thousand characters, and you know, in my mind, that's like that just can be the way that the press the press actually works. And because of my experience with Russian, that I acquired the alphabet, I, I learned how to read in a natural way without mm-hmm. learning the alphabet and in any conscious way any any of the of the letters anything so i also want to ask you about your experience as a kid learning how to read in korean like how mm. do kids like korean kids or japanese kids or, or you know chinese kids how do they go about learning the alphabet because i feel like that can be the way like memorizing i mean that can be the way that kids learn to read in the native language. Right. So I have the feeling that even with the, just last thing, <laughs> I have the feeling that even for Korean, Japanese, or Mandarin, for us Europeans, North Americans, like Westerners, memorizing can be the way. Like it's just there's just so many characters. And I just 
um, hey, this is a strong word, but I just don't like <laughs> the process of consciously learning anything at all. So I feel like mm -hmm. there's gotta be a natural way to acquire it. For example, last thing, if you're actually talking about with your husband, imagine this was his first ever contact with Korean. Mm -hmm. if, if you're doing like sort of picture tracks, so you're describing the picture every now and then. So you're pointing at things, you're using the pictures to make it comprehensible. But every now and then, if you're talking about a boy, for example, you write the word down. So you mm -hmm. say it and write it down. So he knows, okay, so this means boy. Mm -hmm. In a natural way, right? Then then you keep going. There's a girl and you write down girl. Okay, so this is, so in a natural way, he's going to acquire the alphabet. He's going to learn how to read without having to consciously memorize the characters, which again, if there's 10,000, it's a crazy, it sounds crazy to me, right? So this is my argument. This is the way I think, the way it makes sense for me in my mind. But people keep talking about the fact that you need to learn the alphabet. You need to memorize X amount of characters. So what's your take on that? <laughs> it's a long question, long, long story. <laughs> no, it, it, uh, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, and, and I totally agree with you. Memorizing, memorizing can't be the way. Uh, but um, uh, first of all, I think Korean alphabets we we are lucky in a way that we don't have that many okay. characters. So, um, to end to enter the this Korean language journey, maybe it's easier to enter. Um, it's a smaller number of alphabets to remember, and then uh um yeah to enter so i think that might be a little bit easier for korean learners um not saying it's it's easy it, it's just relatively yeah. mm -hmm. less number of uh, characters probably um another thing uh, uh you reminded me of was that he uh, my husband did a lot of uh, research on what are the most common mm -hmm. words um so there, you know, you have be, maybe setting up a goal. The, okay, there are 10,000 characters that I have to know. But out of 10,000 characters, for you to make a daily life in Japan, mm -hmm. you maybe only have to know 1,000. Right. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed. Right. But, Whatever the number, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then to, to just, you don't have to be able to, you you cannot be you don't have to be perfect perfectly memorizing all that per, yeah you you just you just um learn about them and maybe repeat that a couple more times and then I think jumping in right away with the the actual content and materials is is a better way for like you said because mm -hmm. um I remember my husband um when we were listening to a story together and or he was writing something down in Korean, he did use um he sometimes he used incorrect uh consonants or vowels and that and then I just corrected him. And uh maybe he makes the same mistake again and he correct uh, we correct ourselves again and then that that just comes with repetition. So mm -hmm. I think it is very important to remember that um just give yourself a good foundation and you need to get out of that uh that area as soon as possible to actually read uh and remember mm. through reading like you said realizing the sound of the consonant through reading and listening um and because reading is it's you you, you can have unlimited materials of uh reading mm -hmm. And that just that just means you will have unlimited opportunities in the future to to just um read and think about the alphabets that yeah I so so um I do want to remember that and just mm -hmm. want to say that yeah 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 I'm, I'm just thinking that or you could even learn Korean in this case but just by listening so you learn to speak. And then would you through comprehensive input videos, a teacher that teaches this way, et cetera, 
And once you get to a point in which you can understand way more, you can actually mm -hmm. start to read and listen at the at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you recognize the 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 words because you've you know you've been listening to the language for a while, and you can connect them with the with the actual characters. So even yeah. even though you didn't have any contact with the characters yet, or up until that point. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be able to connect them because you you know the the oral speech already, right? Yes, yeah. But uh, getting back to Japanese, even if if there are a thousand, I mean, maybe it's my case because I just I remember hating that conscious process so much <laughs> that mm -hmm. anything that resembles that process, it just it, you know, <laughs> I just yeah. I just don't like it. So. So even if it's a thousand as opposed to ten thousand, even if it's five hundred, just having to memorize them, like the conscious process of memorizing things, it reminds me of high school and so on so much mm -hmm. that I don't like it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but when also when people talk about the most common words, I I always say that because people ask me, even if it's not Japanese or Korean or you know a language with the same alphabet. What do you think about list of the most common words? And my my answer is always, so they're the most common words for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're watching the video, if you're going to a comprehensive input class, watching videos and so on, in a natural way, the speaker is going to use those words more often because they're the most common words, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that, so it's, um, it's a sort of a shortcut, like trying to learn the most common words, but it's okay if you rely on the natural acquisition process. You know what I mean? So it's not that it doesn't make sense. It does make sense because those are the words that you're actually going to use more often, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear more often. But my point is you don't need to consciously attack them or tackle them that way. But in a natural way, those are the words you're going to be listening more often. So you're going to acquire yeah. them without having to pay conscious attention to them. Right. That's the, the whole idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. It it really depends on what your interest lies. Mm -hmm. If if you're interested in uh video games, you all those five uh five hundred common words that you will use at a convenience store is not gonna help you. Um right. so you almost have to kind of make your own uh common words. And how do you get that list of common words? Uh throwing yourself to those uh, content on social media and uh, platforms. Yeah. And then, um, oh, I keep hearing these words over and over. And I, I think I want to know what it means. And I think that, I think that's what, uh, how we can learn naturally. Yeah. What? Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And even because, for example, for people who want to learn English, there's the business English topic. It's so popular. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Instead of going through a list of words, which is what the traditional uh, method tells us to do most of the times, you can just listen to content in English about business. So naturally, yeah. you're going to listen to those words, right? Mm -hmm. But it, even but there's even part of that list of those monk, most common words that naturally are going to show up in any type of content like okay you're playing a video game you're gonna say so i'm going there but whatever whatever the topic whatever the type of content the type of video going mm -hmm. uh, eating those are the things that are going to come up naturally right yeah so again it's not that it makes sense to learn those words but not in a conscious way i keep getting back getting back to the same idea like it's okay if you want to learn the alphabet i get it <laughs> But you can do it in a natural way, or that's my argument, right? And in in that regard, I want to ask you finally about it, whether you remember your experience learning Korean uh, yourself as a kid. Learning, I mean, learning to read, learning the characters. Like, how do you go about it in school or at home? Like, did you actually memorize them, or how was it? Uh, I don't remember how yeah, I learned yes. Korean alphabets. Uh, maybe I remember how I learned English alphabet, but I, I want to say, um, hmm. you know, as a, 
uh, I, I, I live in, I lived in Korea, um, spent thousands of hours with my parents. And I think being exposed, being immersed in that environment, like I didn't, probably there was a time that I didn't know about alphabets. This is, right, this right. is Giyok, this is Nian. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I know how they sound probably through a crazy amount of repetition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then like as a native speaker, I, I um, know that something happened for me. I didn't like that. Like go get it. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. That, that's why it worked. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that's why it worked. And uh, yes, just that that a uh, uh, huge amount of hours that I was exposed to language. I think that just helped everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. That, that that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And, yeah. yeah and probably I was gonna say that probably your parents read to you, and. You could you could already communicate in the language. You could already understand this this the spoken language, right? Mm -hmm. But as they as you were reading, you know, I'm guessing, but they were reading the book to you, and they were speaking. You you understood everything because you you had been exposed to the language. I don't know if you were three four years old, for example, and they were pointing at things. So you were looking at words. So you were mm -hmm. starting to make it to make those connections between the sounds and the reading words. Mm -hmm. right? without the conscious learning of them because for example i remember you know vaguely but not vividly but i remember or i know that for kids learning to to read in spain for example and in other languages we use the m a ma p a pa mm -hmm. you know things like that mm -hmm. or or even there's a funny one with when it comes to English. I still remember that in order to learn the alphabet, we we used the sound, with what which was A B C D E. We use the same song too right? in Korea. Yeah, I, I guess it's worldwide. Which it sounds like a fun way to go about it, but there's there's a funny thing here because when I when I have to spell word out in in English now, even though I can perfectly communicate in language. <laughs> sometimes the funny thing is the, the sound helps you remember those words right it's still in my mind but if you want to say x or y mm -hmm. you, you have, have to, to go through the whole song the whole so, yeah. a, B, C, D, e, F, D, you know and yeah. what i've realized is with words like bip fbi cia like those words that you in a natural way you listen to so many times I'm way faster at spelling out those specific letters than others because they show up in, in more words, mm -hmm. like UFO, BIP. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm weaker because of that, not because of the sun. You know what I mean? So that's mm -hmm. that's the, the whole point, or that's my argument for, you know, for naturally acquiring every piece of language, actually. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Not just focusing on those small pieces first and then trying to piece that all together perfectly even from sure. the beginning I think giving yourself the room to um just be there and then just uh listen and read and just expect yourself to get better at it um through time I remember uh throughout the 12 years of uh, school time I really enjoyed uh listening and reading at the same time whenever we do that it it it's easier definitely easier i know what i'm reading and i know how I, this was r and l and the speaker is speaking r and they they yeah like you said they match and my brain can i don't have to try to if i'm not reading and just listening listening is hard because you know, mm -hmm. some 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 alphabets or some sound become silenced, and they all get mumbled together, especially in English. Um, that was the hardest part to catch. And if you're just reading, sometimes you, I when I read something, I, uh, speak kind of, uh, in my mind as I'm reading. Mm 
-hmm. and who knows i'm pronouncing something uh in the not right in the right way but um yeah reading and listening at the same time mm -hmm. is way easier so i had so uh i remember having so much fun right. doing that instead of yeah. seeing yeah. either of them mm -hmm. so if, for example through listening you already know what boy means when you're reading and listening even if it, you you know nothing about the alphabet you know nothing about the letters you're listening to the story and the storyteller says boy and you see the word you might not mm -hmm. know what b o y means you know you might not know the individual characters but you see boy okay so this is a boy and you already mm -hmm. have you already know what it means so in a natural way you're gonna learn how to read as well so it's, it's, it's the whole point like I don't want to say that grammar is not important. All I want to say is that you don't need to question the study. I, I, I'm not saying that the alphabet is not important. All I'm saying is you don't need to consciously study it. That, 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 that's the whole point when it comes to all the pieces of the language, right? Yeah. You, like you said, like you perfectly said, it all comes, you know, it, it um, like you, you're going to put all the pieces together without even realizing. Now you say right. you the language, right? So yes. it's not that you were on Mondays I'm gonna learn grammar, on Tuesday pronunciation, you know, it just it, it, right. it all comes together naturally. Um I don't know if at the same time, but without you consciously controlling the process, which is something yeah. we also struggle with, right? The lack right. of I, control. I think that is uh that it was I think that is comprehensive, not just uh using one sense mm -hmm. using multiple senses at the same time um that is definitely comprehensive like uh like you said i i don't know i only started learning japanese uh for a little bit but when i watch japanese uh con content in japanese like i always see a certain letter always being used at the end of the sentence mm. so not only i can remember the sound of that um um I, I remember the position so they probably it's related to the the grammar um that's just one of the examples that I can think of for mm -hmm. just picking up naturally and that's never gonna go away because I now I know I I didn't force it into my memory I just naturally realized it okay. so yeah I think that really makes sense yeah, yeah. and it frees you from the stress you, oh I you don't yeah. yeah and then you don't you don't have to be perfect and no one's no one's giving you an exam of course e oh, perfectly yeah <laughs> right yeah it it enjoying it you and you can get to enjoy it exactly that's important exactly all right so any final message for language learners out there um i'm gonna just reiterate what everyone's saying you you should um don't be too hard on your on yourself at whatever progress you have made even it's it's it, you should be proud of yourself all the language learners learning a language is is a thing it's it's a really big deal it's not it's not only um using your brain to when you can just be watching TV or watching a drama and just don't use your brain, you're you're actively trying to learn something. And learning a language is not it, it comes with understanding the culture, why you why this grammar is being used in this way, because it all everything's kind of related to the culture. And if you um truly if you love, if you love the culture, and if you just, if you could just enjoy the journey, I think, I think that's how you um, learn the language and learn, learn the culture. It's, I just want to say, um, it's really hard, uh, especially nowadays that um, it's really hard to not, to compare yourself to other fellow language learners and compare your progress. Um, but again, really focusing on yourself, uh, knowing what progress you have made and finding the materials that suit you and just not following how other people learned. Um, 
in a way, maybe it's reading and learning alphabet first, a hundred percent and jumping onto the book is better for you. Maybe you, that's maybe your personality. Mm -hmm. Um, So really, you really have to ask yourself, why uh, am I enjoying the most? Um, And how do I give myself the opportunity to enjoy the language learning process? And um, yeah, if you think, I also want to say about using different senses, it's, I think it's really important. Maybe uh, it, it's so easy to be just stuck in reading and reading and reading and reading because um, listening is, is difficult. And if you don't understand what I'm list- what you're listening, it's really hard. It's really easy to be demotivated. But yeah. um, that's, w- that's why it's important to give you the chance to listen to something easier. Uh, you have to understand where you are um, and find the right material for yourself so that you can be proud of your progress. You can acknowledge I'm better than three months ago and then you just kept, keep moving on. I I, um, I struggle to do that to my husband. Sometimes mm-hmm. I become just a mean person. Why don't you just know it? It, it It's... Um, so I'm just grateful that my husband doesn't give up and he truly loves what he's doing. Mm. He doesn't stop to research what's new, what, um, what's a new game that I can play in Korean, what's a new book that I can read. Nice. And I think that does a lot, that, that will do a lot. So just well, love yourself that you're doing it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so well, thank you so much, Ellie. And like I said, I'll leave the links to your YouTube channel. Thank you so and, much. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to have you on. Yeah, yeah, it was. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ellie. Have a good day. Thank you too. Bye bye. Thanks so much for watching this interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. And uh, if you want to know more about language learning, language acquisition, like, you know, what's what's the best way to learn a language, ideas for language learning, uh, the best resources at different levels. Here, you can find the whole playlist with all the interviews I've done so far with different researchers, teachers, polyglots, and so on. And finally, right here, you smash this guy right in the face to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.